Hi, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us on the after show. I have Norman Wolf here. If you um, are just tuning in, go back to our interview with Norman. And we're going to continue because we're going to get into relationships now. I think we uh, there's the family dynamic. And now let's talk about intimate relationships because I know they're always challenging <laughs> for most people. <laughs> but it's not bad challenges. It's It helps us grow and creates more intimacy and more gifts and rewards in the long run. You you share with us some how you your how your motto can help. The key to to life in, in my model is well, first of all, as I said in the show, it's activity. So what we do, how we do it, relationship. By relationship energy, it's recognizing the quality of the um, energy passed back and forth between people, and that's often in the domain of communications. And the third element is context. So those are the three elements of the model. So let's apply that to relationship. What we do and how we do it, that, that kind of just sets up, you know, roles we're going to play in a, in a family or in a relationship, right? Um, and, and often that requires just, that's, to me, sometimes the easiest part of it, or should be the easiest part of it. Um, but when, when we start getting into conflicts of roles, for example, the activity like, uh, let me give you an example. Um, my wife feels she's always doing the cooking and cleaning. And so she wants me to pick up some of that. Okay. Now, I might actually be doing as much cooking and cleaning as she is doing. But in my, in my world... It, yeah, so in, in your perception, we in will... My, yeah. Remember I said on the show, we all have our own world, right? Yeah. In my world, I am doing as much cooking and cleaning as she is. Right. In her world, she is carrying the burden and the responsibility for cooking and cleaning. So even if we visually measured how much cooking and cleaning she did versus me, she would feel that she did more. Why? Because her internal context, her, her way of seeing the world is it's the woman's job to ensure cooking and cleaning is done. So the fact that she carries that belief Every time she cooks and cleans, she's carrying the burden. And she doesn't really want to cook or clean less. She just doesn't want to carry that burden. Right. Let me reverse it from my side. In my world, I am supposed to be the provider. If I am not providing enough, if I am feeling uh, that no matter what I do is not good enough, I might start projecting onto my wife that... Um, uh, she's always so demanding. She won't, you know, she, she wants everything from me. Now, and, and I share that one because actually that was a problem I had. And it was really my problem because she wasn't really expecting anything of me. I was feeling this burden of being the provider. And when I shared that with her, in other words, I became vulnerable and shared my, this is my experience. This is coming out of my context this is what I'm feeling and she began to say hey look I don't expect you know to, you don't have to do all this stuff you know in fact I wish you wouldn't sometimes and then I said can I just share my my struggles with you more often she said absolutely I'd love you to the burden came off for of me and I did the same thing with her with the cooking and cleaning so a lot of the conflicts we have in our relationship isn't really about the activity we do, although that's where we um, point the finger. Right? Another one for us is um, uh, she doesn't clean up and she's always picking up after me. So <laughs> we have these two different. And, and we joke about it. And, and I say to her, and, and my ability to sort of get inside her world and see it through her lens she picks up after herself at a rate and then at a frequency and then a pace and in a rhythm with her life and it works for her. Yeah. So she doesn't view herself as not cleaning up. Now, in my world, I'm a little bit more kind of OCD. I like, I mean, when I cook, I'll scramble eggs in a pan, put the eggs in the, uh, I mean, scramble them in a bowl, put the eggs in the pan, and then I wash out the bowl and, and feed them. Right. Now, Jane, Jane would put the bowl and beater in the sink and continue cooking. 
and come back and clean later. Well, to me, that's like, why would you do that? You get you get all these dishes piled up, and it's such a mess. I, I like up. how you think. That's how I am too. <laughs> We're both OCDs. <laughs> so, why just so, stand there while it's cooking? Do something, right? right. Just stare at the pot. Right. Yes, right. <laughs> I mean, put stuff away. You you, yeah. you take out spices, and then you put it right. back. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but but from her point of view, within her world. That's like a waste of time. You you put out the spice and you do this and you do that and then you clean up afterwards right. and put everything away. Yeah. Is one right and one wrong? Not really. It's just her context and her her in her world, she's as organized and clean and neat as needs to be. Now I'm an engineer and she's an artist, so there you go. That's why you know there's a there's a whole different set of importance to organization in those two worlds. So learning to appreciate that, and, and so I can call her all the names and I want, but it's, it, it, it doesn't serve anything. So finding out the, the, the context of our lives, Jane's an artist. I love the fact that she's an artist. If she was an engineer like me, our house would be completely boring. You walk into our home and it's just alive with art of all different kinds, not just paintings, but sculptings and fabric art and, and masks and dolls. And I mean, it's just alive with, and I love it. Now, if I took that, if I made Jane live like I do, I'd be taking away the very thing I love. So why would I want to do that? So relationships is really about going back to this two worlds colliding, um, learning to appreciate the other person's world as much as I do mine. And, and, and maybe I take some of what she does so I don't have to be so OCD. <laughs> I can relax a little bit. It doesn't hurt. You know, the world isn't going to collapse on me. Yeah. Um, and she's learned to, you know, sometimes putting things away makes it easier to find it the next time. So, so we, you know, we kind of learn from each other and, and, and pick up the pieces that, that help us. Uh, and that really is the beauty of relationship. But it requires this ability to recognize that we live out of our context, not out of our activity. Yeah, um, yeah. So what other challenge you think, challenging things that you find in relationship that are actually um, a pathway to, to great, you know, to much more intimacy that people well, don't recognize? You know, we talk a lot about communications, um, and I, and and you know, there's been a lot of work done. I mean, there's been beautiful work done around active listening. Yes. So we, we talk about and, conscious yeah. listening and, and empathic listening. Uh, we actually teach a form of listening that's heart-centered. Now, if you remember the exercise I did earlier during yeah. the, the talk, where I had you go from head to heart, um, imagine when you listen to somebody, you listen from the heart. Mm -hmm. You are open in that state of pure grace, if you want. Uh, compassion and love and you were listening to the person from that place there's no better feeling than to be heard heart to heart um, right. there have been times in in our relationship um, one time I, I can remember that um, early in our relationship so I had a one of the challenges is when when Jane came into the relationship I had a 10 year old daughter and we had a father-son bond that was very strong. So here comes the third person, and unconsciously, we did not realize, I mean, we loved her, we recognized it, but, you know, just the pattern of that energy bond between me and my daughter, I mean, Lindsay would say every word of her mouth was always, daddy this and daddy that, and to his Jane going, what am I, chopped liver? Don't do that even. I, I'm here too, you know? Oh yeah, 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 right, yeah. So we had a lot of struggles around Lindsay uh, in, in the early parts of the relationship. And there was one time when Jane got really angry at Lindsay about something Lindsay did and disrespected Jane's studio and, you know, an artist's studio was, and Jane invited her up and asked her to make sure she cleaned it up afterwards and she did not. And Lindsay, are you going to go? Yeah, I'm going to go upstairs. I'll be up, you know, and just never did. And boy, Jane was just livid. So Jane and I were going out to dinner, and uh, she was really quiet. 
And I said, what's the matter? And James said, uh, nothing. I said, well, that's not true. <laughs> and, and then I, so I, I coaxed her into you know, sharing with me and she says, you're not gonna like what I have to say. I go, well, it's in this space anyway, so say it. And she just landed on Lindsay and started to, that <laughs> little bitch and this and that. And, you know, and, and Lindsay, you know, at that time was my little princess and she can do no wrong, right? So I am listening to Jane and there's a part of my brain that's going, how dare you, you, you don't understand. You, But I didn't go there, instead I went into the heart. And I just listened. And I did actually more than listen. I actually said, you know, if I stepped into your world, I could really appreciate why you're so angry. But you know, that act of compassionate, heart-centered listening shifted Jane's energy. She said, well, you know, it's probably not as bad as I'm making it out to be. It triggers me because, and then she started to do a lot of discovery about her childhood and her relationship with her mother and all of that. But it was that act of me being able to listen to her from the heart and be totally appreciative of what she's saying, not defensive at all, um, that, was, that gave her the space to be able to shift. And I've had a, a, a relationship where a woman did that for me and it, it just freed me up to, to, to look at life differently. Mm -hmm. So I think key to the ability to shift the context is, is the ability to listen from the heart, speak from the heart, be able to move from the head to the heart and, and live and interact from that space. Now, we don't do it all the time, obviously. I mean, the, when we're talking about going to the movies, we're not going into the heart center. Yeah, yeah. But when something really difficult comes up, that's the best skill I can, I can offer people. Yeah, it's, those are opportunities for us to really learn and grow, though, too. That's, when, that's where the growth comes from. And that's the skill, and it's a learnable skill. I mean, we, it's, it's really easy to practice, just like but it take us like three minutes on the exercise previously. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, what long. I've learned is also like how, like you were saying, is how you frame something, right? Like you could have looked at it like, how dare you as my daughter, and yet you also stepped into a different framework. Yes, yes. And, you know, they say you can't change your past, but you can change the way you look at it. Yes. Same thing with the situation, your relationship. Yes. You can't change the other person, but you can change the way you look at it. That maybe stepping into their shoes, right. um, understanding the the quantum, the the three D part of the. A absolutely, and and in, and in my model, I call it shifting the context or reframing the context. So you're right. The frame we use and and that we bring to it defines its reality. That's why I use the word context because. If you think about what that word li literally is defined as, it's to give meaning to something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so our context gives meaning to every experience we have in our life. Yeah, yeah. And what we have to do is reframe it. Yeah, and yeah, because, you know, you see people, I mean, I, I, this is a drastic example, but, you know, Oprah talks about being molested multiple times in her childhood, and yet she used that that experience to propel her to do more good because I know she like I think for a whole season she just brought pedophiles and she helped the FBI catch like tons of them now she looked at what happened in her childhood with a different context than someone else that you know other people that that happened to and they just go down this dark path and maybe even leading to suicide or early death or whatever it is same incident or same uh, experience as a child, two different framework, two different life path and outcome. Yeah, yeah. My my daughter um, is, as I said, uh, building her business around the Amway model, uh, and and um, she's been doing a lot of studies, and she shared one of the studies about two twins, mm. both grew up with a very abusive alcoholic father. Mm -hmm. One twin set the frame or the context. Uh, he's my father. I'm like him. We're one and the same. And he grew up as a alcoholic, abusive father. Okay. The other twin who said, I'm not like that. I'm not going to live my life like that. 
and he grew up opposite. Yep. Twins, right? So yep, yep. genetically, they're very similar. similar. Right. <clears throat> and it's in the choices, the way they, as you said, frame their experience. Absolutely. That define the outcomes of their lives. Yeah. yeah. So this is why I'm so big on, on talking about context, because it's that yeah. framing we do right. that really defines everything. Yeah, how we look at it. How we look at it, how we frame it, how yeah. we understand it, how we give meaning to it. Um, yeah. And and often, I mean, one of the really interesting um, observations I made, look at some of the greatest spiritual leaders, Oprah, came out of a very negative environment. Uh, Neil Donald Walsh, who, who wrote uh, Conversations with God, yeah. he had a period where he was dumpster diving. If you, if you look at his biography yeah. and his yeah. movie, right? He was dumpster diving. He was the... Yeah, he sat there in front of a dumpster and some kid was looking at him yeah. and he goes what am I doing with my life uh, Tony Robbins the very famous Absolutely. you know yeah, yeah. power of thinking yeah. uh, he was living out of pizza boxes in a dump and, and he turned his life it's often those very uh, most ugliest moments in our life that is the springboard yep. uh, that gives us yeah. the opportunity yeah. you look to at say Martin Luther King and Martin Luther Mother King. Teresa I mean all the people that even like as a society and whole the Jewish community absolutely how how much they've excelled even generationally going back thousands of years they've been persecuted and yeah. they're always the ones that come forward come forward right so it's in our Oppression. It's in those those times where we feel we are stomped down on our knees in a fetal position. Is right. how we climb out of it that transform. And and it's how, yeah. The key is how we climb out of it and how we frame it yep. that transforms our life. Yeah. And it usually gets to the point of I either am going to lay here and die. I'm going to do something about it. Absolutely. And that's the transition point. Yep. Now, the bottom fortunately, of the, pill, the pit. That's right. <laughs> fortunately, we have the capacity to not go down that far to make the changes that just are just as significant. Um, so you, you, if we take that opportunity, and that's really what you're trying to teach people, I'm trying yeah. to teach people, is don't wait till you get to the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, yeah. 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 Make these the choices early when the conflicts are this small, not when they're that yeah. big. Right? Yeah. And you know what I found, Norman? I mean, you, and you tell me if you agree with this. The more, the first time you go through the pain, like I'm looking at relationship because that's probably the, the, the first breakup you have, whatever, 15, uh, 16, eight, whatever it is, it is the like you feel like your body is going to break. Like I remember thinking if a bus ran me over right now, it would hurt less, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think every first love crush is like that. But each time, it still hurts, It, but it it gets easier. The t- it does. I totally agree with you. And I think the reason for that is we begin to learn. The first time we think the world is going to collapse on us. Yeah. Right? I mean, death is just around, you know, like a, a second or two away. It's yeah. It hurts so bad, there's no way out. <laughs> but then we find a way out. So the next time it happens, we go, oh. Wait a minute! I, I I survived the last one. Maybe I'll survive this one, and it gets easier and easier yeah, and easier yeah. to the way to to the point where you go. You know what? That's just another downturn in life. It'll yeah, come yeah, around. Yeah. And the whole point is, if you if you just go through it, like allow the emotion and do the heart centered exercise, like you were talking about, ground yourself and just because the. It's it's like a wave, like it'll it's come huge, and then and then it and then it 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 goes down, and then it'll come again, and it'll be less. But the more you try to run away from it, the harder it comes. Yeah, I, I love I love your example of a wave because I often talk about it the same way. If it, if we think of it as energy, and everything is energy, yeah. right? So this experience I have is this energy build up in my body now. If you just let it pass through the body, mm-hmm. it dissipates. Right. But if you keep pushing. focusing on it or pushing against it, you're not allowing it to flow, so it builds up. It's like you have a dam holding back yep. all this running river energy, yeah. and it just explodes and brings you into the worst condition possible. Right, right. But if you can open up to it, 
Um, I remember a book I read that was by Richard Bach. I think it was The Reluctant Messiah or something like that. Um, and in it, the Messiah, the, the gentleman that's representing that kind of guru-like character, loses somebody. And in the process of that loss, he, he um, screams out his pain. And he lets it flow out like phenomenally, like a like a a wolf howling. Yeah, yeah. Just let that energy and, out, and, right? And then, and then he gets up and walks away. Mm -hmm. He yeah. doesn't carry it, you know. Doesn't carry the grief. He releases all of the energy, yeah. takes a breath, and moves on. Yeah. And and that's. That's a good model to remember, and, and I like the way you said that if you let it flow through you, uh, it doesn't get stuck. Now, it doesn't stop us from feeling it. We're supposed to feel We're it. We're supposed to feel. That's why... That's we, why it comes up. Yeah, and I think that's we become a nation of, of anti-anxiety, anti-depression, anti-all these things, but, you know, all that are gifts given to us. Now, of course, there are some people who do need that because they've got the instability, but I don't think the way we've, we're going, you know, that we're seeing that, um, it just creates more physical pain. It does. I, I'll give you a story. A friend of mine was, uh, probably still is, when I, mean, I used to live in Southern California, uh, he, he was a physician down there, and he, he told me the story that whenever anybody came to him for uh, medicine for depression, anti-depression medicine. He would write out the prescription. Mm -hmm. Then he'd take it and put it inside an envelope with their name on it. And he said, he, excuse me, here's your prescription. It's here for you anytime you want it. But I'd like you to do one thing for me. For three months, I want you to spend at least one day, probably two or three, serving like in a soup kitchen or someplace yeah, yeah. else. Yeah. And then come back to me after three months and you, you can have your prescription. Yeah. He said in 10 years he never gave the prescription to anybody. Yeah, yeah. It's that shift in framing you were talking yeah, yeah. about. I went from focusing on me mm -hmm. and my oh, right. woes me, woes me, into now sometimes that's easier to do than others and sometimes I'm not opposed to medication to help the initial shift yeah. break yeah. the pattern. Uh, chemistry can often help that, but the real secret is getting that shift of framing or context that we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. Work, work on, on experiencing it. That's what life is about because if you, what I learned from being in relationships that I was not happy because you shut down, right? You shut down because you're like, I, I don't want to feel this pain. But, <laughs> right. so, but what you, I realized later is that when you don't feel pain, you also don't feel joy. It's all the same. Right, it's same. it's joy is not the opposite of pain. Joy is the same as pain. Indifference, what we've learned, That's is right. really the opposite. So yeah, it's you, it's an energy wave, as you said. Yeah, and so what I've learned now is you can't experience joy, bliss, happiness, peace, love unless you experience that other side because it's all that process. It's it's connected. You know the the Buddhists uh, talk about this notion of impermanence. Uh, nothing, nothing is the way it, you know. Nothing stays the way it is, yep. and and some people really don't like that. But it, what they're really talking about is this notion of this energy wave. It comes and goes. It it has a, a peak and a trough, you know. And, and and to live life, you have to live the whole wave. You can't just have peak, 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 peak. It has to be a trough. Yeah. Um, yeah. No and, decision is a decision. No decision is a decision. Because there are right. there's also consequences that come out of that. That's, everything <laughs> has a, has an outcome. That's right. Every choice has an outcome. It's yeah. just a matter whether it's the outcome you want or not. Right. So uh, you might so as well make a decision because at least that outcome is based on a conscious decision that you made instead of not doing anything. And then it's just whatever. Then you got to pick up the. And decision. you know sometimes you don't know what the outcome will be until you make the decision. And the yeah. beautiful thing is you can make a new decision. That's true. Yeah. That's my, true. My, daughter, my daughter was coming out of, uh, she, she went off to college, left Southern California, went up to uh, Seattle to go to school. And in the spring of her first year when she was being asked to say whether she was coming back the second year, 
uh, she called and says, you know, I think I'm going to go back to Southern California. Or I'll enroll in school down there. And da, 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 da. And I listened to her and I said, well, it sounds like you've thought it through and you made the decision and I totally support you. So she made the decision. A week later, she called me up crying. I made the wrong decision. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> and, and, and I should have known better. And I said, Lindsay, there's no way you could have known better. It wasn't until you took the step from where you were yep. to where you are now that you were able to see that decision wasn't the right one. Absolutely. If you never made that decision, you would never know whether that was the right decision. So you made the decision to leave and you realized how important it was for you to stay. Yep. And, and so she made a new decision. And she went back and talked to the head of the program and, oh, fine, you can stay. And everything worked out. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes we have to make a decision to find out what the right and wrong decision right, is. Right, exactly. <laughs> you got to go through that door to see what the next through. door is. That's exactly right. <laughs> and the next door might be go back to the room you just came from. Exactly, Who knows? Exactly, exactly. That's, that's what the beauty of life is. That is the beauty of it's, life is it's the journey. Full of, what is it? Uh, Forrest Gump said, you never know what you're going to get. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and if we can live life that way, it actually becomes quite an adventure. It's like an exploration. It's a box of chocolate. Yeah, it's a box of chocolate. You pick up life one. Life is a box of chocolate. <laughs> right. <laughs> Each one has its own delicacy. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Norman. I really appreciate it's been a pleasure. this. It's been a pleasure. Yes. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Jacqueline. You take care.